Next up, please welcome Carmel Martin, the Managing Director of State and Local Partnerships at Emerson Collective. Mark Dunitz, the CEO of New Visions for Public Schools. Servon Lewis, Infrastructure and Mobility Support Specialist at Newberger Berman. And Jenny Sparandara, Executive Director of Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase. Back to lead the conversation is the Atlantic's Adam Harris. So, Carmel, I'm going to start with you. Um, you're Managing Director of, of um, the, at the Emerson Collective, which the Atlantic is affiliated with. But I wanted to ask you, sort of, where are the gaps between what businesses need and what schools are currently providing? What, what, what needs to be filled? Well, I think there's a lot we need to do to ensure that students graduate ready for both college and career. Um, I, I'm here to pitch that in addressing the future of work, we can't really effectively do that without thinking about a pretty radically different vision for what high school should look like. A lot of the conversation around the future of work sort of is grounded in the post-secondary space, and that's an incredibly important area of focus. But um, Emerson uh, is a sponsor of the XQ Institute, and we put out this recent publication, I have a few copies if you're interested in getting one, called High School and the Future of Work. And in this paper, what we're arguing is if you look at the skills that are going to be necessary to be successful in the workforce in the future, it means that we need to create lifelong learners. And we can't wait till a post-secondary system to take care of that. So we argue that there's two things that need to happen. We need to up our game in terms of academic rigor and we need to up our game in terms of getting um, students a broader array of social, emotional, and career readiness skills so that they can, they're gonna have to change jobs 11 times in, in a very short period of time. So uh, in terms of academics, even if they're gonna go to a, a, a non-traditional four-year college, they still need college-ready academic skills. They need college-ready reading and math. So we weren't wrong about that, but we also have to give them much greater opportunities to learn in ways that build student agency, creativity, um, co uh, ability to collaborate in teams, which means much more exposure to project-based learning, work-based learning, applied learning. So they have to get out of the classroom. And we argue that communities across the country need to sit down and say, okay, given that that's what kids need, how would we structure high school to get them there? Which means got to make some pretty big changes. And Jenny, if we can't wait for post-secondary education, um, is, it, is it businesses' responsibility to kind of fill that void and, and kind of... Um, put forward, I guess, one of the resources to kind of fund that innovation that, that's necessary for the jobs of the future? So, I mean, at J.P. Morgan, we think the answer to that question is yes. That business has to be at the table, is at the table, and I think the question is how do we sort of engage in the most meaningful way and how do we really leverage what it is that we're best at um, in this space? I mean, just to build on Carmel's point, uh, we had been uh, using our philanthropic resources really to think about that post-secondary space. How do we support adults in building their skills, in, in navigating this shifting labor market, which has always been dynamic. I think rightly it's getting even more attention now with the rise of automation and AI, but I think I'd make the argument that it's been changing in pretty dramatic ways for a long time. And, and part of our challenge has been that we haven't sort of built that sort of approach to lifelong learning, to serial reconnection with education and skill building that we should have. So at JP Morgan, we think about what kind of resources can we bring to bear, one of which is philanthropic dollars. So, so one of the things we'll talk a little bit about today is our investment in career education through something we call New Skills for Youth. But I think the other you know, question is, how are we showing up as an employer partner? How are we offering sort of internships, apprenticeships, work-based learning um, to young people and adults in the communities in which we, we live and work? How do we think about the sort of data acumen that we have as a firm and how we can apply that to community problems and, and use also sort of big data that we have at our disposal to drive community insights. So, so we really think how can we bring all of those pieces to bear? Um, and then how do we provide sort of leadership for other companies who are either trying to figure out how to do the same or who have great ideas for how they're engaging in this work that we can sort of build on, augment, or sort of learn from. 
And I have the same question for you, Mark. Can you repeat the question again? Uh, so so who's, whose responsibility is it? Um, and is, is it kind of business's responsibility? Is it high school's responsibility? If we're, if we're not waiting on, on post-secondary education, what does that kind of future, um, that, that training for, for um, the skills for entrepreneurship, what does that look like? Right. So I, I wish as an organization working with high schools, we had the power to dictate priorities for the business sector. We don't, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, uh, but what we do, uh, so really the focus for us is asking the question of what can we do in the high school space uh, to do a much better job of preparing students for the workforce. Um, and uh, I think you know, how we come at this question is um, from an angle, and we work in New York City just for context where we have about 470 high schools, uh, 1.1 million students in the public school system. As we look across this massive school system, uh, there are no shortage of tremendous uh, examples of powerful opportunities that students have through small programs, generally fairly small scale at single school or multiple schools, um, for connecting with particular uh, uh, employment pathways, for getting exposure to it, for beginning to develop a set of generalizable employability skills, ultimately for transitioning into pathways that lead to employment. Uh, for us, the problem is not reinventing this. Uh, the problem is uh, creating the conditions to scale it. Uh, right now, that is the experience of only a fraction of students in the system, um, and that's, uh, I think, the case in most cities across the country. Uh, there are a tremendous set of obstacles um, to implementing a, a set of experiences for students in high schools. Remember, uh, we have elevated standards. New York State has some of the most complex graduation requirements in the nation. Five exams, 44 credits distributed in certain ways. So the logistics of carving out the space while tending to uh, the sort of demands we've placed on the academic side to do things like robust internships, the demands on schools who we've largely left responsible on their own to cultivate myriad relationships across the business sector to create uh, spaces for students to do meaningful internships and to coordinate the relationships between all of these partnerships in a school uh, is not a small undertaking and I think we've uh, grossly underestimated uh, the infrastructure challenges. So for us, uh, there's two kind of major areas we're working. One is uh, to, to really establish uh, a, an effective common framework for the types of career preparatory experiences we expect all students to have uh, and to establish that on equal footing uh, with the types of academic expectations we have of high schools. Uh, the second is really to create the infrastructure so that the burden of solving really a systems problem doesn't fall unrealistically on each of 470 high schools individually, um, but that we have a sort of infrastructure which includes management tools, data sharing, um, entities that are capable of cultivating the partners and making the introductions and helping to maintain those partnerships uh, that would make it realistic for us to reach more than a small fraction of the students who really would be benefiting from these experiences. And Saran, so I wanted to, to go to you for, for kind of the personal experience, because you grew up in the Bronx, you went through one of these IT programs, um, and now you have a job in, in IT. Um, so can you kind of talk a little bit about um, what that path was like, kind of from, um, you know, kind of going, going kind of an alternative path to, um, to a career that, that you're, you're enjoying? All right, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, coming from the Bronx, I was going to uh, Samuel Gompers High School, and what I was presented with was up to three options to choose from. But there was some sort of bias or so that I actually placed each student into which technical program. I was placed into AutoCAD. Uh, going through that school, it was probably, in my opinion, 30% uh, to 70% um, technical to academic you know, uh, structure. So you wasn't really presented with much of an option after leaving uh, the school. You were taught that your trade that, you, that you're learning is what you should pursue going into college because that's going to be your money maker. And I, I, I stuck to that. I learned AutoCAD, I went to college for AutoCAD. Did not work out because my interest really wasn't there, but that's all I knew. Going uh, just, Thinking uh, from the future, and in hindsight, I wish uh, I had many other options, such as what I do now in IT, uh, software engineering, uh, desktop, um, just infrastructure support in general engineering, computer science, you know, you can name all these different areas. If those were presented to me while I was in high school, I believe that probably the four years that I feel I wasted after high school may have uh, not happened. 
Yeah, and, and I guess a question for for the panel is, is how do you prevent that kind of tracking um, so that so that by the time students are thinking about going to a four year school, um, that that doesn't happen. Yeah, I think that's such an important question. In education policy debates, which I've spent most of my career working in education policy, we see this resurgence of this idea that the people who were pushing for college for all were wrong, and now there's all these people thinking they need to go to a four-year college and not getting these going these other pathways. I think there's some truth that we need to make clear to students that there are different pathways, that I think we have to be honest and say you need a post-secondary ex uh, experience, a credential of some sort, so maybe it won't be a four-year traditional undergraduate degree like I had, but it, it, is, it does need to be a post-secondary credential, and we, we shouldn't resurrect the system of tracking that was prevalent prior to the college-ready push. Um, because we know what's going to happen in this country. There's going to be, you know, the kids that, my kids are not going to be put in the career track. They're going to stay in the college track. And then un, um, low income students, students of color are more likely to get put into the vocational track. So I think it's a really critical period right now to, to sort of help people understand that we still need college ready, but we also need more diversity of pathways. But if you look at the research about the future of work, technical skills are extremely important, but they're also dynamic. So spending a lot of time teaching students in high school a narrow set of uh, technical skills might not be the best way to go. It might be broader skills around computer science so that once they get to the post-secondary space, they can, they can learn specific skills, but then also learn how to keep learning throughout their lifetime. And and just to, to pick up on some of those points, I, I think quality becomes the sort of big piece of the puzzle here, which is we want high quality options for both college and career readiness, right? So if, so Servan goes through this career education kind of coursework, but it isn't sort of the breadth or the depth of what it is that he really needed. It really wasn't a high quality pathway. And I think what we see then as a result is that rather than sort of connect you and help you connect the dots around post-secondary, it kind of threw up some walls. I think you know a big part of what we're trying to do is increase accessibility to high quality career pathways that really expand and broaden your understanding of the labor market, which you know fortunately you, you were able, able to, we were talking uh, before the panel, you were able to access through Perscolis, which is a community-based organization that you got connected with, which sort of like reopened that pathway. But the issue of quality and accountability and then you know what kind of good data do we have to understand what's actually happening uh, when young people are moving through these pathways. They're all keys and all parts of the, you know, sort of um, the ingredients, the kind of special sauce that we're looking to support at J.P. Morgan. And Sarvan, I actually wanted to go back to you because what advice do you, do you give to, to other students um, who might be coming up through your, through your alma mater? Uh, well, they need to, well, the advice that I would give to uh, students coming up they need to understand what are the incentives of going through these programs, such as if you're, if you're going to, let's say, a computer science class, what are you gonna get out of it after doing 40, oh, four years? Are you going to wait 60 minutes for the school bell or are you going to design a, a software that you can possibly sell, think of entrepreneurship, coming out with six figures, uh, maybe after four years of high school? Because four years is a long time going through high school you can come out learning a lot. Uh, I believe uh, students should really seek the outcome at the beginning, and schools need to really hammer that in. I believe that in a um, minority-based high school, l knowing that you can make over six figures doing something such as Cisco, CCNA, software engineering or so, that will really uh, brighten the eyes of a lot of students, especially mentioning that you don't have to go to well, you're not obligated to go to another four years before you can start making money in, in college. Mark, um, so there's, there's kind of a notion that, that um, one of the best ways to succeed in, in kind of the New York City tech sphere is, is through the STEM field. Um, and I guess, is, is there, um, what, what are some of the other options there? Um, and how, how can public high schools kind of prepare some of those other options? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, New York City has a diverse economy and there's a wide range of occupations. Um, my own experience is uh, the 
educator as a principal was founding a school of television and film production that focused on the below the line occupation, so where the bulk of jobs are in the industry. At the time, it was an example of an industry that had grown tremendously through tax incentives. We had 100,000 or so jobs at the time connected to it. There was not a single high school program out of 470 high schools in the entire public school system that had a serious orientation towards the trades in this industry. So I think there's a lot of examples in healthcare, um, certainly a lot of examples in tech, but um, you know, again, there, my, my advice would be to not underestimate the logistical challenges of realizing these opportunities. At every step of the way, we see uh, uh, disconnects between different parts of a system that should be working in a complementary way. So at the high school level, if we know that there's certain pathways available, and there are in fact thousands of seats available for the students who choose not to go directly into a traditional college program, many of them publicly funded seats in job training programs that are meaningful and employer connected, if we know that those are available, we need to engineer a set of experiences for students to be informed and to learn about those things early enough on so we're not making decisions for students and their families, but students are in a position to make an informed choice, and then we have an existing set of institutional relationships that will support their successful transition. Accomplishing that at any scale, just that sort of piece of it, uh, is un, uh, unexpectedly complex in, in uh, the types of systems we're talking about that don't have a history of working together, that don't share common infrastructure, that don't share information across programs. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work to be done on the nuts and bolts of this. Um, and um, I think too often um, we get excited uh, with the sort of bleeding edge of innovation uh, and we overlook the fact that we're dealing with numbers, we're dealing with large complex uh, systems in which information needs to flow in a timely manner, experiences need to be lined up across multiple years of a student's trajectory and across multiple partners and institutions. And so that, that's where a lot of our attention ha ha has really been focused. There's kind of an underlying theme um, that, that it kind of runs counter to, to my previous conversation with, with Chancellor Folt, um, that is essentially, it, it may not be necessary to have a, a four-year degree, uh, but a, a credential, kind of as you mentioned a little bit earlier, is, is important. It's kind of, it should be recognized that. Yeah, I guess I just want to react to that in saying, uh, it, it may, there are lots of good jobs that are based on um, post-secondary credentials and even two-year degrees. But if you look at the data, it is definitely more advantageous to have a, a high quality uh, four-year degree. Now there's some really bad four-year degrees out there that are not good, good. Students are graduating and the debt to income ratio makes it not a great option economically at least. But if you look at um, in the last recession, um, the number, the 99% of the jobs lost were lost to people Sorry, I got that backwards. 74% of the jobs lost were lost to people with no post-secondary education. Only 1% of the jobs in the recovery went to those people. 99% of the jobs went to people with some post-secondary education. So, and, and in that bucket is people with less than a four-year degree. But if you look at unemployment numbers, you're less likely to be unemployed. If you look at whether your job is more subject to be eliminated from automation, you're it's much less likely to happen to you if you have a, a four-year degree or an advanced degree. So I just say that to say, yes, we need to give students more options. Um, not everybody is gonna go get a four-year degree, but, but there's still a high value as a society. And I think if you look at the predictions around automation and globalization and the impact on the job market, we should be pushing for many more people getting those four-year de degrees. And the inequities in our system around that need to be addressed or we're not gonna be a successful economy. On that note, I want to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, we have a microphone here and a microphone back there. One here. So everything I've been hearing is about technical skills and nothing mentioned about the humanities, liberal arts, or anything, either on the college level or, or before. Um, don't we need m more of a balance there for people to be well prepared for the marketplace communication skills, interpersonal skills, critical thinking, that kind of thing. Yeah, what is the role of kind of soft skills and kind of that liberal arts education in kind of this future workforce? We, we think those skills are, are essential. I mean, 
in fact, I think there's been a lot of discussion in the field broadly about what do you call those skills, and even like, we can't call them soft skills, they're foundational skills, they're essential <laughs> skills. Like at, at some place in, around the United States right now, they are debating what to call that set of skills. I think for us, the point would be we shouldn't be obsessive about which majors or which career pathways those are built into. They should be in all of them. They sh they're the bedrock for the, the work and the workers that I know we're looking to hire at our company and that we hear from our clients and customers they're looking for. I think the, the issue is that we have to continue to um, innovate around how we teach them. We have to figure out how to contextualize them to the world of technology. And we have to think about maybe how you leverage some um, philanthropic or sort of uh, flexible money to do that. And I think that's where we see ourselves as being able to play a role. Um, but, but I think we'd say they're essential, um, but we have to figure out sort of how it is we can support their development. So I would urge you to take a look at, it's uh, page nine of this big blue book. You could grab one or you can get it online at xqinstitute.org. This is a McKinsey report, and these big lines are, uh, this is jobs of the future and what skills are going to be needed. This top bucket is technical skills. So it, there's just no question. We need more people with much more advanced technical skills than we've got. This bucket, and this is just how McKinsey put them in buckets. They could go in different buckets. Uh, this next set is social, emotional, and here's higher order thinking skills, which, you know, a lot of the humanities programs really focus on higher order uh, thinking, complex problem solving. So I think the answer is we need both. Um, particularly in a world where people are going to change jobs 11 times in a very short time period because they need the technical skills to be s successful for many of the lucrative jobs that exist in the economy, but they need that basic um, education that helps them navigate how they're going to have to reskill and re-up as they move forward in their career. I would just, I would just add to that, that that I think, um, and this goes to the school design question, um, of how our schools are currently designed. Um, one of the challenges is um, it, it's very difficult to authentically teach uh, many of those skills in the often feeling uh, uh, environment of high schools that feels very inauthentic. Uh, and it's difficult to engineer a set of experiences for a large number of high school students to engage in real world experiences where those skills are often best taught. And so I think that there's often a design challenge there how students respond uh, to being exposed to a workplace versus how they respond to being in their ninth grade algebra class uh, is, is, is dramatically different. And uh, for certain types of skills, it really, there is no substitute for having some real world exposure, but it's a difficult thing to engineer. So one here. Hi. Um, I've, worked, I've volunteered with high school students, um, really smart high school students. And I feel that pain that you folks are talking about. Uh, Mark, especially, you, I mean, I appreciate the logistics of this hierarchy and the funnels not talking to each other. Could you and Carmel especially talk about um, pockets of success where people are actually, whatever, breaking through the funnels or the silos where you are scaling up in terms of these opportunities so that they're not, what I think you were calling kind of standalone experiences that don't go to other places? We have um, 18 schools that we're funding across the country that we th would see as examples of excellence. Some of them are really just getting started because they've redesigned themselves in their new schools. Um, and we're sort of just beginning the process of understanding where they're hitting problems in, that exist in the system, but we're also starting to partner with state and local level leaders around this vision of using design thinking to help communities recreate schools. Um, I think there's some states and localities are, that are doing a particularly good job in terms of, and largely with J.P. Morgan funding, uh, thinking about how to get greater work-based learning into schools. Washington State, Tennessee, Colorado kind of jumped to my mind most quickly on that question of um, you know, getting kids work work-based learning opportunities. So I think it can be done, but I think it is something that isn't being done at, at scale at the moment. 
I'll give an example of one that's early stages in New York but has, I think, real systematic potential. We have a huge summer youth employment program historically in the city, uh, and there's attempts to realign those opportunities. So rather than just any job being funded over the summer for a high school student, it aligns to something that they're studying and being exposed to during the regular school year as part of a career preparatory program. Jenny, Sirvan, Mark, Carmel, thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you for having us.